Welcome everyone to this speaker series on negotiating with adversarial counterparts. My name is Fiorella. I am the head of operations at the CCHN. And maybe um, before we start the session, I'll just quickly give the floor to Mathilde, who will tell you a little bit more on how to work with Stenomatic for those of you who would like to have subtitles in French and English. Mathilde, the floor is yours. Hi everyone. So very easy if you'd like to have yeah, the transcription in either French or Spanish. I've put the link um, in the chat. So you click on it and then you click on join and you can choose either uh, French or Spanish and then you click on join again. And then uh, the transcription should appear in either the language you chose. So either French or Spanish. And that's really it. So super easy if it's not working send a message but uh it should be working so there it is okay. very good thank you so much Mathilde for organizing all of this so I see we have quite a lot of CCHN community members members from the CCHN family but I also see a new faces and names who are joining us so I'll just say uh, something very short about the Center of Competence on Humanitarian Negotiation who we are and where this speaker series is coming from so the CCHN is a strategic partnership between MSF the ICRC UNHCR and WFP and it is really our core mission to foster peer learning among frontline humanitarian negotiators on, of course, negotiation. So we do a lot of research on negotiation practices in the field on given contexts or themes. Out of that, we develop tools and frameworks that help you prepare for your negotiations. We offer spacious spaces for peer learning and exchange in peer workshops, negotiation workshops, but also for just like this one, where we bring experts who are not part of the industry, who share their research, their views, to also enrich the conversations that we are having in the community of practice. So this speaker series, at the moment, we're having two speaker series in parallel. One is on negotiations with military counterpart, and this one where we're more looking at negotiations with adversarial counterparts. And these are really the speaker series where we bring in experts from different industries to offer this platform for exchange. Of course, our speakers present their own research, their own views. They're not necessarily the views of the CCHN, but this is exactly the beauty of these platforms where we bring together people with different backgrounds for exchange. And we're really looking forward to a very, very fruitful exchange here over the next a bit more than one hour. It's really a distinguished pleasure today to welcome Professor Smadar Cohen Chen. Um, she's Associate Professor in Organizational Psychology at the University of Sussex Business Schools, and she carries out a lot of research on emotions, emotional regulation, and emotional expression. And she is here with us today to share her research with us. And with that, Smadar, I will hand over to you. And and if you'd like to add a few more words on yourself, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, we're over the moon to listen to your presentation. Just a small disclaimer, everyone. Um, the presentation is recorded, but we're not recording the question and answer. So we can also have a free conversation with each other. And with that, the floor is yours, Madar. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really, really excited um, to be here. I'm... Um... I, I talk about this research a lot, but um, not with, uh, usually it's with academics. Um, and I'm really excited to um, be talking with people who actually experience, right, and can give feedback about these things um, on the ground. So um, I'm very excited. All right. So um, <clears throat> I, um, I'm going to be talking about um, emotions in um, negotiation. There's some, um, Fiorella, tell me if this is okay. There's some things that are very um, uh, staty or um, or very academic. If they're unclear, um, please, someone stop me and, and I can explain a little bit um, more. So 
very briefly, um, how do we, um, in kind of the field of research um, on emotions, how do we define emotions? Um, emotions are flexible response sequences um, that happen or are elicited when someone appraises a situation as A, important, so it has to be relevant to us. Um, and then it's determined um, by whether it, um, it shows, right, offers challenges or opportunities. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more afterwards. So we have an event, essentially, right? Um, someone based on their personal experiences, their personality traits, the context, um, a million and one things, um, appraises the situation as something certain. And based on that, um, there is an emotion that's elicited um, and that emotion um, leads to um, certain attitudes um, and certain behavioral tendencies, which people can um, can act on, right? So for example, just a, a tiny example, anger elicits um, what we call an action tendency. So it, it gives us the, um, the tendency or, or the willingness to do something, whether someone gets angry and doesn't actually punch someone else in the face, right? They can, they can pull it back. Um, but there is that aggressive um, action tendency. Um, so um, the first thing I want to kind of talk about is the power of emotions. Um, and I teach my students negotiation and there's always someone who says, oh, no, 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 no. I'm rational, I'm unemotional, emotions have nothing to do with my decisions. Uh, and my answer is usually, um, that's impossible. Um, because we all have emotions. And I think one of the things that we're finding now in research is the more we, um, we ignore them and don't understand emotions, the more we are subject to them controlling us um and so what i usually say is it's better to understand emotions and how they work um and how they are functional or dysfunctional um so that we can use them in the right way um and and, and control them um so i'll start by talking about um this kind of uh um framework um that we've that we've put in the in the literature about emotions specifically in negotiations and in conflict and the idea is that people talk about positive uh, emotions and negative emotions um but positive emotions and negative emotions are defined very very differently um by for example academics who work with um you know cognitive uh, in, in cognitive psychology, um, where positive emotions are emotions um, that feel very good to us, so are, are pleasant, that's what we call valence. Um, whereas in social psychology, and specifically in political psychology, where I'm, my background is, um, we talk about positive emotions and negative emotions based on their function. So do these things lead me to behave in a way that's functional for intergroup, interpersonal relations? Um, and so we created this framework and we called it the valence function or the do good, feel good. And the idea is basically um, that when we think about um, emotions in negotiations and in conflict, we need to think about these two dimensions together. Um, and so for example, an, an emotion that feels bad, right? Feels pretty negative um, uh, is guilt. But we find that in research, um, inducing guilt in people makes them um, behave in a way that's very functional for intergroup and interpersonal relations. So people who feel guilty um, tend to take responsibility. They tend to apologize. They tend to make reparations. Um, and so we stuck that in the quadrant of feeling bad but doing good. Um, on the other hand, feeling um, bad um, and doing bad um, is an emotion like anger. Um, much more, um, I would say, hatred. That's a really interesting emotion, right? But we'll go for anger um, for now, right? And that is an emotion that has negative valence, so it feels unpleasant, um, and it leads to aggressive behavior. Um, and these emotions can move based on different um, 
different aspects. Then we get to emotions that feel really good, um, but lead people to um, behave and often specifically in conflict. So I think very um, uh, relevant to you guys um, is pride. So we feel really good. We feel empowered. We feel strong. We feel good about ourselves or our in-group. Um, but pride has been found um, to lead to some negative consequences in negotiations. Um, so not, not um, behaviours that are functional for conflict resolution or um, integrative negotiations. And the last one is hope, which is my absolute favourite uh, emotion. Um, and that is what we call a do good, feel good emotion. So an emotion that feels really positive, re feels really pleasant. Um, people are very motivated to feel it. But it also has been found to lead to concession making in conflict, um, support for humanitarian aid, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So some really good functional outcomes um, from there. Um, so this is a little bit um, from the from the literature about um, what I've been talking about. So, for example, we can talk about experiencing negative emotions, um, fear. Uh, has been found to induce cognitive freezing. Um, and so it's very hard for people um, to kind of get an input and cognitively accept new information when they're feeling fear. Um, it leads people to focus on threatening information. Um, and my favorite, my favorite um, uh, example is when you're feeling not good um, and you Google um, your symptoms, um, I don't know if people do that. I I I can only see Fiorella. Um, but yeah. Um, but so lots of people will Google. Um, will Google uh, their symptoms on Google, and what they'll find is they're probably going to die in the next five to ten minutes. Um, but they don't actually remember all the the findings, all the Google um findings that say you've just got the flu maybe take a paracetamol, right? So people actually focus on very threatening information. If we take that to um, intractable conflict contexts, um, what we found is that um, we gave people this platform um, where they could actively search for different information. And we found that people who um, experience fear compared to hope tend to look right so they tend to um to, to actually effectively search for information that just reassures their fear even more whereas people who feel hopeful um which i'll get to in a second tend to search for information that supports um uh their their conflict resolution um ideas um people who experience disgust uh, tend to make more severe moral judgments of actions so some really interesting research um on actually unrelated disgust um so it's really fun being a social psychologist because you get to do all these really weird experiments and then people read about them um so this is not my work um but people um gave participants um, kind of just moral um, events or situations to judge. Um, and uh, in, in some of the participants, they used a fart spray. I'm really sure, I'm really sorry that this was recorded, but it, it it's in the, the journal. You, so they, they sprayed fart spray, so a disgusting smell. And what they found was that disgusted people made more severe moral judgments. So they looked at certain actions and said, you know, that is immoral, much more or significantly more than people who uh, who were not. So we know that disgust has this effect um, on people. Um, ha hatred and humiliation lead to aspirations of annihilation um, of the other side. So unlike anger, um, which which is a really interesting emotion, so it can be functional, but it can also be dysfunctional. Hatred and humiliation are there is almost no situation where, the, where they are functional um, to a relationship. So they lead to aspirations of annihilating um, whoever you, you hate. Um, and that is 
uh, and that has been found to lead to extreme aggression and support for um, for aggression. Um, anger uh, is characterized by short term aggressive responses, but actually in the long term, um, it is it has been found to sometimes be functional because it is based on this idea that that person or that group has wronged me, um, but they are able to change. And so in the long run, um, what some people have found is that participants, when they induce anger in them, um, are more willing to make concessions because they feel that power, they feel powerful. And so they're willing to make more concessions in, um, in negotiations. However, contempt, is characterized again by rejection and social exclusion of the other. So contempt is is very um, is is very hard to to find any functional outcomes for contempt. Um, again, anger can lead to risk taking, concession making, um, and here we see two emotions that feel negative, but actually they have some good outcomes or good as. Um, you know, that's a moral judgment, but um, I think you'll agree. So guilt encourages support for reparations and apologies um, to our groups. Um, and empathy is linked very much to cooperation. And I put empathy in here because it doesn't feel very nice. Um, we think about empathy as a very positive emotion. But again, people don't like to feel empathy that much, um, right? It hurts to see someone in pain, to see someone suffering and to feel their suffering. Um, actually, that feels quite negative to people. And so we can sometimes find people who are motivated to not feel empathy so that they don't have to go through that, um, that experience. In terms of positive emotion, um, hope has been found to induce um, concession making, um, support for agreements for conflict resolution in intractable conflicts. Um, and in general, when we're not talking about specific emotions, um, positive uh, emotional experiences uh, lead to pro-social behavior, collaboration, engagement, positive relationships, uh, and, and a lot more communication. Um, whereas on the other hand, again, it's that do good, feel good. Pride is associated with increased intergroup aggression. Um, so one thing that we need to, and this is where kind of the field of emotion started, was understanding what emotions lead to what outcomes. Um, but the next step in that field was, okay, well, now we understand how different emotions make people behave. How can we use that? How can we change that um, so that we can take a more active, um, a more active, I guess, role, right, in changing, I don't want to say the world, but behavioral outcomes. Um, and so James Gross um, started looking into um, a field called emotion regulation. Um, and emotion regulation is anything that influences, right, um, which emotions we experience, when we experience them, and um, to what extent we experience them. Um, and the interesting thing is it kind of started with a person regulating their own emotions and has spread to look at how people regulate each other's emotions. And so I'll get to that um, in a little bit. Um, and so one of the things that um that I was very interested in um in my in my PhD was um hope. Um and what we um found was, and I'll kind of give a little bit of an, an uh, um uh, background, um, was okay, what is hope? Hope is, right, this, this positive emotion um, that people feel when they think about the future and they believe um, that the future can be better. Um, but how can we change that, okay? And particularly in very extreme types of conflict, how can we change that emotion without discussing the specific conflict itself? And so what we did, um, was we came up with a very simple intervention, um, and that is conflict malleability. So we would go to people and we would say, 
Okay, we're not talking about any conflict in particular. Um, but what we found is that conflicts, like like everything else, right, are malleable and can change. Um, and what we found was that when we manipulated this, as in we um, had one condition in which we we told people that, they felt more hopeful, right, in a specific um, conflict context, and they were more willing to make um, concessions in that specific um, conflict. Um, we also found the same type, right, this, this malleability um, uh, intervention worked when we did it um, longitudinally. So we told people um, that things can change, groups can change, um, humans can change, um, <clears throat> sorry. And what we found was that even six months later, right, they were more um, likely to experience hope um, and more likely to make compromises um, uh, in a specific conflict. Um, and then one of the things that that I wanted to do um, was to say, OK, well, when we talk about conflicts, you know, uh, we're saying conflicts can change, but actually, you know, conflicts are pretty awful thing right um and so what we're implying to people is that conflicts can get better um and so we came up with this intervention um in which we didn't talk about conflicts we didn't talk, talk about anything right we simply got people into what we call the dynamic or a changing world um mindset um so for example we had them draw pictures of either a dynamic world or a stable world um or we told them uh or we gave them seemingly um um reliable information about the fact that the world changes all the time and is dynamic or the world doesn't change um, and what we found was again even giving them a little picture to to scribble led them um to apply this message right so if the world changes all the time then even right a specific conflict can change um and they experienced more hope and would therefore um more likely or we we induced in them more concessions in the conflict what am i trying to say is um hope is good for us right so if we're thinking about um, emotions that we want to induce in other people, we want to induce um, hope. Um, and I'm sure we can have a really um, interesting discussion about that. Um, but but that is essentially what, um, what the data finds. Um, guilt, really interesting. So the idea of, um, this isn't mine, um, this isn't my work. Um, this is Sabine, Sabina sahajit Clancy, and she, she talks about, right, how um, we can affirm, right, a positive, people want to feel good about themselves. Um, and so what, um, what Sabina and her colleagues found was that by letting people affirm a, 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 one aspect of their self-worth, right, um, we basically um, allow them to feel good about themselves, right, which left space um, for them to feel guilty about past um, past intergroup um, atrocities, um, at, which led them to feel more guilty, right? Take more, but feel more responsible and um, uh, support more reparations um, for for the outgroup. Um, and so I thought that was a really interesting um, kind of intervention, right? Um, we didn't, I mean, she didn't find that when she looked at um, the group level. So just by saying to someone, write down what you're really good at and someone saying, oh, I'm really good at, I don't know, maths. I'm not really good at maths, but right. Um, really good at something or I'm a kind person or I'm a good mother or my good father or something, something positive, positive about themselves allowed them to to let in that negative self-worth that's associated with guilt, right? So we need to, to help people um, to, to, to be able to feel something um, that negative like, um, like guilt. Shall I pause for questions or are we doing it all in the end? 
I'm hoping that everything is clear so far. I can't see the chat. The chat. There is no questions in the chat, so I think we're okay. good. I think you can. I don't also don't see any hands, so maybe you can just continue and then. Okay questions in the end but also for the colleagues if you have questions please put them in the chat and we will discuss them later yes please um excellent all right so um yeah so so that was kind of a taste of this idea of um how can we use interventions general um messages or information that can help people to um to, to experience certain or, or regulate their emotions um, in a certain direction, right, in the context of negotiations, um, and particularly in, in, in difficult political um, situations. Um, so the next thing that I kind of want to talk about is this idea of emotional expressions. Um, and I think, I think this is very um, relevant to you, but just going to talk for a second about the theory. Um, and and this idea of how emotional expressions give the other side information right about what the expressing party is feeling what their intentions are what their attitudes are what's important to them so a whole big um slew of or a, a plethora of information is hidden with this this with within this idea right of emotional expressions and yes, right, this is what I always say to, to students, and you'll also see it in, in the findings, it would be better if people would actually tell us about their intentions and their attitudes and, you know, all of this information. Um, but they often don't, especially in contentious um, uh, negotiations, they don't. And so humans have learned to use emotional expressions. Um, and and we we know this, they, we do it subconsciously, right? Um, to, to glean information about attitudes and, um, um, and uh, behaviors. So emotions, uh, emotional expressions contain information. Um, but it also depends, right, like I said, what our relationship is like. So in a cooperative relationship, right, we have things like emotional contagion and reciprocal emotional responses. So what that means is emotional contagion is all the research with two people or two friends, or family members who sit in front of each other. Right. And what we see is when one expresses a certain emotion, the other expresses the same emotion starts to feel the same emotion right so if i'm sitting with um my child right um and they are laughing and giggling and feeling really happy right in what will happen is i will start to to get that right it will it will it will pass on to me and i will feel more happy reciprocal emotional responses is similar but it's when i feel something that is appropriate for that relationship so if my husband feels pride because he got a new job and is going to make tons of money then I might not necessarily feel pride but I feel really happy because I can use all that money to buy food right so it's but we have this flow between um people with whom we have cooperative relationships right with these reciprocal or the same emotions but when we have a competitive relationship, right, what we find is that people are learning, they're studying, they're looking, they're testing the other side's uh, emotional expressions, right, um, in two ways. The first is they're going to, right, if I hate the other side and they're feeling happy, then I, I assume that whatever's good for them is not good for me, right? So I'm going to feel the opposite of that. So if they feel um, hopeful, I'm going to feel despairing. If they feel, you know, whatever, happy, I'm going to feel sad or angry. And the second is um, that that people will um, tend to, feel, to, to see these emotions as strategic, right? What does this mean about me in terms of information? Okay, so if someone is feeling um, anger, then 
I'm going to learn from that, that they're coming very close to their reservation price, um, right? So they're, they're, they're coming close to their boundary. Um, if they feel fear, right, then I learn from that, right, that I'm being threatening and this is working, I'm going to push harder. And so we find that it's much more of a strategic um, inferential um, process. Okay. Um, and so these are some of the um, the findings about emotional expressions. So, for example, anger expressions can induce concessions in negotiation. So we find that when someone observes someone else making an angry expression, right, um, they um, they tend to make more concessions, right. But what we find is it can also elicit retaliation in the longer term. So. Right. If I'm negotiating with someone, um, what the research has found is that when that person makes makes angry expressions, right, and that can be facial expressions, what we find is facial expressions, verbal expressions, or written expressions, and there's no difference between them, um, between these modulations, right? Um, in the long term, I'm going to get back at that person. If I get the chance, I'm going to right retaliate um, against their angry expression. Sadness expressions, right, have been found to induce cooperation. So if I say that I'm really sad, my um, uh, the person who's who's negotiating with me, right, um, might feel bad for me, right, um, and make concessions. But and and this is right. This is a problem when we don't know the other person. We don't have a trusting relationship with them. It can also, and it has been found to also be interpreted as weakness, right? Which leads people to um, take advantage. Um, hope expressions um, have been found, right? To um, increase concession making, right? So what we found in a number of, um, in a number of studies is that out group members who make, who say, I feel hopeful, right, about ending the conflict, um, elicit from the observing group, from members of the observing group, um, elicit support for the agreement. Because hope means, essentially, my enemy, my outgroup, right, feels good about the possibility of, of ending the conflict, right? And they support this agreement, okay? And so we, what we found um, is that it works. However, um, we've also found that it it's less likely to affect conservatives um, in these conflicts, okay? So it's more likely to, to affect um, doves or, or people with dovish um, political ideology. So, Right. If we know that emotional expressions have this information, right, um, then, you know, we we want to use them. But lots of or most of the research shows that actually emotional expressions are to some extent a double edged sword. Right. All of the emotions I've showed you. Right. And there are much there are much more. Um, all of them have possible positive outcomes but also possible negative outcomes um and so in this kind of um more recent line of research moved on from hope um right um i got very interested in this idea of expressing indifference and i'll explain what that is in a, in a second and what we see is um that mainly in lots of um uh, more professional, more industry related um, literature, um, showing poise, showing control, using a poker face, right? Um, but also in the academic literature of, you know, um, this idea of the normative bargaining approach, right? Where rational emotions are just for people who can't control themselves, right? They reflect low ability to regulate yourself, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of support for um, expressing indifference in negotiations and in conflicts. Um, so I got really interested uh, in that idea. Um, and so I started looking at um, indifference expressions. Um, and so I first want to explain, explain what indifference is. Um, 
in super academic terms. Um, imagine you're lying on your couch, uh, watching telly, uh, eating crisps, I don't know, you know, whatever. And you're not feeling anything in particular. That is what we call neutral emotion. There's nothing going on, right? There was no event except the crisps that makes me feel happy. But um, there's no major event that I should have any any emotional response to. Then the door opens and in comes a bear or a lion, whatever, some big scary animal, um, right? Comes in, the emotional response that we would expect, right, is fear, anxiety, terror, whatever it is. If a person is still lying on the couch eating their crisps and watching the telly when a bear has come in, that's indifference, okay? So it's a non-emotional response uh, to something that should technically, right, um, elicit some, some, uh, some emotion, okay? Um, and that makes indifference a really interesting, we like to call it an anti-emotion. So it's, it's the void of an emotion. It's a bit like despair, right? So it's described in emotional terms, but it's not actually, it's a non-emotion. It's a non-emotion, right? And in terms of expression, right? Um, it's apathy. It's verbal utterances like, I don't care. I don't feel anything. Um, flat uh, expressions, um, flat tone and voice, um, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, see, I put there with the bear. That was, yeah. Um. <laughs> So I got very interested um, um, with some colleagues at what is happening with, with in, in conflict, in interpersonal conflict, what happens when people express indifference? So the first study, what we wanted to do was actually see what do people think they are expressing when they express indifference? So we ran a study, we asked people, have you ever, right, people who have engaged in negotiations, have you ever expressed um, indifference in uh, in negotiations or in conflict um, negotiations, right? And um, then we asked them, right, um, what do you think an expression of indifference is, right? Is it positive? Is it negative? Or is it just a neutral expression? <laughs> right? Um, and um and then right we uh what we we found was and we asked them what um choose one expression during a dispute what would bring the best results for you um and we found that uh, a lot of them right um chose uh chose indifference right um and but i think what was more interesting was that um people significantly so statistically significantly more thought that this was a neutral expression so they're going around the world right um expressing indifference in negotiations and dispute they they think oh i'm just you know i'm being cool um i'm using a power pose whatever a poker face right and i'm i'm, I'm being very neutral about this um and so we tested that uh in many studies uh, just so many um and what we did was we presented people with a conflict um a work related conflict um in some of the studies we told them that they were going to meet someone and actually negotiate and some of them it was vignettes um and then we um somehow in different ways sometimes an email sometimes a chat message um sometimes a video of people expressing um we had the counterpart express indifference um compared to different things and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second um and then we measured uh, two kind of mediating outcomes one was expected collaboration so to what extent do you think that this person who's just expressed indifference or other emotions, um, how much are they going to collaborate with you? And um, the negative affect. So affect is just the emotion, right? So to what extent are you feeling negative emotion in light of this expression? Um, and then in some of the studies, we had actual cooperation. And in some of the studies, we measured um, intention. So 
how much do you intend to cooperate with them? Um, and this is one of my favorite studies. Um, and what you will see, right, is something quite interesting. So in the first experimental study, we compared uh, expressions of indifference to anger, contempt, neutral. So they just say, I'll, you know, I'll meet you in a few minutes um, and hopeful expressions. And what we find is that indifference expressions, right, are lower, significantly lower than any other emotional expression, right? So in terms of, right, what you would what you would expect, right? And I found contempt to be the most interesting, right? Um, it would be better, right? People think that this expressing person will be more collaborative when they express contempt than when they say, I, I'm not feeling anything. I don't feel any emotion, right? And what we think is going on is even when you feel contempt towards someone, you care enough about the situation or the person to feel an emotion, right? But indifference really is that person means nothing. Um, in terms of negative emotion, same. We had the highest, um, the highest uh, negative affect um, in the indifference condition compared to anger, contempt, um, neutral, and hope, um, which we found really um, interesting. And in the second study, we ran this again. We found um, uh, the same thing, only we didn't measure negative affect. Um, we measured um, we measured actual anger at the person who was expressing, right? And we found that, um, right, so indifference expressions are leading to uh, less expected collaboration and more anger, and this is leading to reduced cooperative um, intentions. Aha, there we go. Oh, yes, okay. So in study three, um, we wanted to further explore this. We ran this in a study and we hooked people up to um, uh, heart rate variation machines, um, which was super fun. Um, and we also had them watch a video of um, actors. So we brought an actor and an actress um, and we had a whole day of it um, and we um, we recorded them basically, you know, having this neutral versus uh, indifferent expression saying, you know, I just don't care, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I wanted to see whether they're actually having a physical um, reaction to this and also how it's leading them to um, to cooperate. Um, so in terms of physiological measures, we saw a decrease in HF HRV, um, which is high um, high frequency heart rate variation, um, right? But what is suggesting, right, is that someone expressing indifference um, is actually triggering a fight or flight um, response. So we have dysfunctional emotion regulation, negative emotions, right? They're having a really hard time containing these negative emotions, right? Compared to a neutral response, which is not triggering that. Um, but what we found was that the indifference expression was leading to um, reduced cooperation intentions through the inferential pathway. So they are having a fight or flight reaction, but that's not what is reducing, right, their cooperative intentions. It's actually them saying, again, hmm, that person is indifferent. They're not going to collaborate with me, so I'm not going to collaborate with them, right? So it's a very strategic kind of thinking about um, about the, the other side's intentions, um, right? But I, I still thought it was fascinating that people had this real physical reaction to um uh to indifference expressions so in the uh, fourth measure we in the fourth study sorry we measured a behavioral uh measure so we had people log on we told them this is going to take one minute uh, you, this is going to take i think four minutes or three minutes um and um before you do that you can send the other side a message we had them write out a message and here's the message that the other side has sent you and the other side sends them not really but they get a message saying i'm indifferent um and then we said you can choose 
to leave the negotiation. You, you're not going to negotiate with that person, but it's going to, it'll take up to a minute um, to get you a new partner, right? So it's about 25% um, percent of their time, which we pay for, um, right? So are you willing to incur a cost to yourself um, in order to, right, punish or avoid the other side um, in terms of not negotiating with them. And what we found was that participants in when they saw this indifference expression were three times more likely to leave the negotiation, right, compared to those in the um, in the neutral condition at a cost to them, um, themselves. And again, it was it was mediated by this expectation about their collaboration, um, uh, which led to to less cooperation. The studies five and six, we're going to do that really quickly so we have time for questions, um, right? We we wanted to make sure that it was really this, this message, right? So the idea was, what if, right, a person will say, right, specifically, I really want to cooperate with you, right? Um, or, right, does not say anything. Um, then what happens to the to the indifference um, expression. So we had a two by two. Um, we had again had an, the same conflict, right? We had expressions of indifference versus neutral. Whoops, sorry. Um, and then we had expressions of cooperation versus control, right? So in one group, um, uh, they would say, "I'm I want to cooperate you, with you, but I don't feel any emotional re response, right?" Versus, "I want to cooperate with you." and nothing and vice versa. And then again, we looked at expected collaboration um, and cooperation. Um, and what we found, see, this is the statsy part. Don't look at the, the graph, it's awful, right? What we found was that in different expressions reduced this expected collaboration, right? And subsequently um, cooperation, but the effect, effect was much stronger when cooperation wasn't mentioned. So when they don't get that, explicit information that I want to cooperate, they're using the indifference expressions to glean that information about their expected collaboration. Um, right, so we're, you, we're, sub, we're, we're basically um, uh, substituting actual information about collaboration intentions with an emotional expression. Yes, so um, this was the indirect effect, right? Um, and so, you know, some of the, the these ideas about indifferent um, partners um, that came up, right? Um, I think it's important to remember um, that that indifference is used either as a power pose, right? Or people remember study one, right? Um, people think that it's something neutral, um, and so, you know. It's possible that they, you know, they want to hurt or lead to less cooperation. But but I don't think that that's necessarily the case. And if we understand that as negotiators, right, then we can ignore it. Right. We can basically say, OK, that person, they're not trying to offend me, hurt me. Right. Not cooperate. They simply want to appear more powerful or more controlled or more regulated or they think this is a neutral expression. Um, real indifference means that they would not come to the table, right? When you do not care about this situation at all, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be there. So there's something that they do want and we need to find out what it is, okay? What do they care about? Um, and then when we're thinking about emotions, right, particularly in, in indifference, right, um, we need to remember what are people feeling because it's functional for them, right? Do they think if they express anger or aggression, I'm going to make more concessions, right? Um, and also, if we're trying to induce in people things like guilt or shame or empathy, we need to also remember that they don't feel very good, right? So we might want to substitute that for something that, that we want to, to, you know, we want to help people to feel those emotions, right? So that we get those functional outcomes in the, um, in the negotiation. This is all to say that emotions are a really 
strong tool, right? And we want to understand them more in depth and we want to use them in a functional way um, uh, rather than ignoring them or underestimating them. Okay, so um, so yes, yeah, so I've, I've said this, but thinking about which emotions we want to experience. Do we want to feel hope? Um, do we want to feel anger? Do we want to feel empathy? Do we want to feel pride, right? Um, and I, I like to think about the this this as like a, a a golf bag. I don't play golf, but I once heard right. This is a really good analogy. Um, it's it's about what is the situation? What is the context? What am I trying to achieve? Do I want them to um, to I, I don't know to feel guilty um do I want them to feel really good about themselves do I want them to make concessions so maybe I want them to feel hope maybe I want them to be a little bit more risky so maybe I make them feel ang anger um I want to think about which emotions um we want others to um to experience okay how are we going to induce that in terms of what we say um what emotions do we express um to them to in to um, regulate that emotion and then again thinking about um which emotions other people would like to experience right a lot of oftentimes people really don't want to experience these negatively valenced emotions so we should try and find emotions that make them behave in a way that we want but but they're very motivated to feel um yeah so Identifying different emotions and their role in negotiations, in conflict, understanding how they're helpful and harmful um, and in what contexts, recognizing how emotions feel in us, um, what triggers the emotions, how they can be regulated, what messages they send to other people. And then the other way around, right? How do how do other people's emotions feel to them? What are they leading them to feel? What triggers them? right? And then regulating, stimulating, expressing emotions in a functional, strategic way um, in emotions. Um, I think we're in okay time. Um, I want to thank the NTR for their grant that helped fund this and the London Business School Behavioural Lab that ran our study up until the, the first day of lockdown. Thank you so much, Smadara, for this really, really interesting presentation and discussions. We're coming to the end of this expert session. Really a warm thank you, Smadar, and also all of you for having been here and your interesting questions. So next up, Dr. Ahmed, that might actually be interesting for you. On the 20s, we're having a session on de-escalation around healthcare. So if you're interested in joining that, Smadar, you're also welcome to join us, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I've just put the, the link in the chat. So that is next Monday. And on Tuesday, that is for our other speaker series on negotiating with military counterparts, we will have a retired colonel who was both part of the Tigray People Liberation Front and later the Ethiopian Army, and of course also UN peacekeeping missions, who will speak about perceptions arms carriers might have of humanitarian practitioners. So all very, very interesting things coming up. We will also have more speakers in this series on negotiating with adversarial counterparts among them will be Francesca who is also with us here today we're finding a date for her presentation and we're looking forward to welcoming all of you to our upcoming events I wish you a wonderful rest of the day and those of you who start the weekend this evening of course also a very nice weekend thank you everyone have a good day